Well, friends, uh, as we get ready to step into this teaching today, um, today is what we like to call one-off. We are not going to be in a series today, starting next week on our uh, series uh, on Ephesians, the book of Ephesians that Paul wrote. And uh, we'll be working our way through that um, for a little bit after this season. But today, uh, we're, we're dealing with the topic of seasons. And we're going to look at it through a specific lens in the book of Genesis and also through uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. And as we turn towards it, we, we recognize and understand that there are, um, there are seasons in life, right? And ever since a week ago, about right now, a season has been upon us an ever-increasing measure, right? Last week, we had no snow at this time. My, how the seasons change right? We look outside and it's very clearly winter. When we think of seasons, one of the things we have to do is understand that they are God-ordained times for the world and for us, his creation, to not only rest and grow and do different things, but they are God-planned, God-set-in-motion things. They're seasons, and we cannot change them. And what we need to do today is take a minute and understand that, um, that seasons are very clear, and it's not hard to look out and see what, what season it is right now. I, this reminds me a little bit of that winter we had in 2013-14. Oh, you remember that? Oh, you all forgot it? Okay, so here's what it was. Like, this is a number of years ago, but 2013-14, we got like five inches of snow in October, and I was like, babe, we got to move. This is not acceptable. Because for me, I was raised, I moved quite a bit when I was young, but I was raised between Colorado and the Central Valley of California, and then also in San Diego. Do you know what it feels like to be in winter when you went to high school in San Diego? Yes, it's a six-month toothache. And there's no in and out burger, but that's a different subject. And this is one of those things where I look at it, I'm like, oh, it is so cold. But in 2013 and 14, we had one of those winters that changes everything. The lake froze solid, which means we became a very bad version of Wisconsin. And it just, remember, it's just cold and horrible. And, and if you love snow, that's on you. And, and it was just like constantly blowing and snowing. And it was, I remember one day it was like 12 below. And I was like, what is going on? This is like Hoth, if you're from Star Wars. This is terrible. This is not acceptable. And for me, as a person who doesn't enjoy cold, I remember that bitter winter. It may not be my favorite season, but it's not like I can do much about it. Because I remember on tax day that year, April 15th, it snowed. And I was like, as if taxes weren't enough. <laughs> now this. And I thundered at the heavens that spring was to come. It snowed harder and I have no authority in the heavens. But, um, <laughs> but I do know this. That bitter winter was one where you're like, oh, will it ever end? There are seasons in life. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the original setting of the seasons. And then we're going to understand that God is doing something in the midst of those. We're going to do that out of Genesis chapter 1. And um, in case you don't know, um, by the way, this font is called Chiller. Huh, I thought that was a good choice. It wasn't mine, but it was still, somebody did good. Um, so uh, this, this is the original creation narrative. I love the creation narrative because if we lose the fact that we are created, we lose the God-given identity we have. Creation matters. And God set into order in creation the seasons. And this is what it says. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from night. And let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? We chart our, our days, weeks, and years and seasons by what? The movement of the sun. Somewhere in June, the sun's like way out into the north. Right now, it seems like it's over the south pole, you know? It's way to the south. And then the, right around September 20th or something, it's right down the middle. It's, it's east and west. We chart ourselves by the movement of the great lights, by the stars. We can count the days, the weeks, the seasons. The greater light, the sun, the lesser light, the moon. We can tell in its cycling of full to full moon down to the little crescent moon. We can see what time of month it is. We, we have these things given to us by God in creation. It goes on to say, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. Did anybody wander outside after about 11 last night? I know you're like, no, it was two below. 
But when you went outside, if you did, it was as bright like midnight blue sky with a bright silver moon, and it was just it was like daylight outside. It was incredible. And we see that God did indeed put two lights in the sky to cover the day and the night. And they have their seasons, and they set for us an understanding that for us, seasons have purpose. So it's our job as Christians understanding that we need to be finding purpose in the seasons of life that we're in. And in order to do that, it's probably good to just maybe take a quick look at creation and understand that in creation there's planting, harvest, fallow, and preparation. So there's the season where you prepare the soil, the season where you plant, the season where it grows, harvest, then it lies fallow for a season. It goes unused. Right? We have those seasons in creation, in us, in, in humanity, in people. There's nourishment, there's growth, there's producing, and then there's rest. We have seasons that go on in our life as well. And one of the realities is, if you don't believe in seasons, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what you believe, they just are. And we need to look at our lives through that biblical lens and ask the question, do I see the season I'm in? As a gentleman in my 40s, I have found that I'm in a very different season than my 15, almost 16-year-old son who can look at a donut and get a six-pack, and I look at a donut and it attaches itself here and here, right? I, I, can't, I can't behave the way he does around food, around sports, because I would break in half and you can all visit me in the hospital. Those kinds of things, right? Because I'm in a different season of life. Whether I like it or not, the reality is he and I are in different seasons of life. And if I don't like it, it doesn't really change my preference. I have to live in this season that I'm in. So today what I want to do is understand that in, in being people, we have seasons of nourishment where we grow both physically, emotionally, spiritually. We have seasons of growth, seasons where we're producing, and seasons where we're supposed to rest. So I want to talk about that for just a few minutes today. Because there needs to be balance in the life of the church. And in case we forgot, the church isn't a building, it's us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There needs to be balance to it. So if you've only learned then you must maybe take a look at life and begin applying and growing. Let's say you've been in a season of learning and you've adopted all this language and knowledge and stuff into your head and you, you haven't ever really used it. Maybe it's time to start applying it and, and actually growing with it. Not just taking in, but growing. I think the, the best way to look at it is if you went to medical school, you became a doctor, you became as whatever the most, like let's just say you became an orthopedic surgeon, and you've done all these things, and you're so good, you know everything, but you've never taken what you've known and used it to heal someone else. What use is the knowledge then? What use is, if, is the knowledge if the only season you're intent on being in is personal acquisition of knowledge? See, for us, Learning is good, but it has to be applied. If you've only been producing, maybe you need time to rest and be nourished. I know a lot of people in this congregation who serve at the drop of a hat. And they work, they serve, and just give, give, give. And what I would say is sometimes you have to ask the question. If you've only been producing and hitting the grind really hard, maybe it's okay for you to step back and grow a little, rest, and be nourished. Take some time to reflect on what God's done, but also to reflect on what God might be doing next. If all you've done is produced, in a workaholic society, we begin to think that production is our value. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Your value is not in what you produce. Your value is in who you are in Christ. And through that comes the production of the fruits of the Spirit that grow in us because of the presence of the Spirit. Maybe if you've been grinding for a long time, it's time to step back and rest and be nourished. If you've only been growing personally, maybe it's time to harvest a little bit. Maybe it's time to harvest. You know, I think my favorite season of year in Michigan is right towards the end of May 
when those little tiny corn shoots start popping up in the fields around us, they've turned all the fields, they're dark, and then all of a sudden you see these little rows of green, they're like that tall, and you're like, welcome, corn, it's good to see you again. Like, I feel very happy about it when I see the corn pop up, and then, um, and then like, you know, knee high, waist high in July, and then it just kind of explodes and gets super tall, but, but when you see that corn begin to grow, and you look at it, and you're like, oh yeah, how lame would we be if we never harvested it? We just kept growing corn. What for? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Seems like a good thing to do. Thanksgiving's coming. But how, like, it's just dumb. At some point, we look at it and say, we have to have a harvest in our life. There has to be life where we produce. We don't just grow. We actually produce. And we serve, and we put ourselves into the grind for a season. And we really grind and we serve with the gifts that God has given us. You can't live on a mountaintop would be a good way to say it. Have you ever been up to a mountaintop? I remember as a little boy, uh, we would go fishing at these two lakes called Weir and Johnson. And between the two of them were, uh, were, was this connected little stream. And I was little, and I had the patience of none. And um, so I would run between the lakes. And I think people and bears were like, I'm not going to eat that one. He just seems like he'll make me nervous. Like, I just was, I was a little wild animal. And I would run around, but I remember running up on that mountain. I'd like, for the first day or two, I'd be like, hee, hee, hee. Why? Because I was at 11,000 feet and there was no air. I couldn't live on the mountaintop. I couldn't just be up on this mountaintop doing what I wanted. There's, there's, there's a point at which trees stop growing, and that's why the mountains have those sharp peaks at the top. It's called tree line because there's not enough oxygen to grow the plants. You can't live on a mountaintop. You can't have a great experience where maybe you've been growing personally, you grow to this mountaintop experience, but you can't live there. Your life is lived in the valleys, in a slower trek where you remember what God showed you on the mountaintop, but you don't stay there. And this is a natural inclination. And when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, what happened is Peter saw this and went, well, this is really good. It would be good for us to stay here on this mountain and build three houses. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you, Jesus, because this is really awesome. That's what Peter said. And Jesus was like, no, no, no. Toosh. Back down they go. Because Jesus knew he had to climb the hill of Calvary. He couldn't stay on a mountaintop experience. We can't just keep growing personally without ever being harvested for the kingdom of God. Our life should be producing something that changes the world around us. So what I would like to do is look at, for a minute, seasons through the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is a book written by Solomon, and Solomon was the wisest of the world. He was as good as it gets when it comes to poetry, um, anthropology. He was a botanist. He was a zoologist. I mean, he did a ton of stuff. Solomon was amazing. I mean, he was the guy with a man bun, a cool beard, and a ukulele. He was that guy. He had it all. I think, I mean, a couple things that were wrong with Solomon. I think he had like 300 and some wives, so that had to be rough at the holidays. And, um, and like, you know, he, was, he, had his, he had his issues, but he was the son of David. He was the king of Israel, and he is this, this amazing person who has lived life to the fullest in every way. No pleasure and no thing was he denied in his existence. And at the end of his life, towards the end of his life, he writes a book called Ecclesiastes. And the theme of the book is this sentence, toil and work, it is all in vain. I am grasping at the wind. Oh, it was perfect. Did you hear the kids are like, no, I know, right? Did you hear him over there in the little kids area? That's awesome, but that's what it was. He had this amazing life, and in the end, he's like, what good has it all been? I've had everything, and I find that I'm just grasping at the wind. I can hold on to none of it. That's what Ecclesiastes says. It's the heartache of someone who walked away from God for all the things of this world. And what we need to recognize is also in the book of Ecclesiastes comes this set of scripture that talks about the seasons says this for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven a time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted a time to kill and a time to heal 
It's a good place to stop for a second. Um, it's, it's almost the end of the year, right? 2017 is largely in the books. It's behind us. We've got just the tail end finish of 2017 right ahead of us. And um, we're looking at the end, and I'm always reminded on these days that it's not how you start, it's how you finish. How do you finish? That's the theme of the book of Kings. People start out well and they end a dumpster fire. How do you finish? What if we try to finish well? And I think this scripture helps us. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. What habit, what action, what addiction, what behavior needs to die in your life? Maybe today. What should end today? So there is a time to kill. And there are certain things in our life that it would be beneficial if we cut them off and gave them life no longer. What needs to die in your life? What do you need to kill in your life behaviorally? Maybe an addiction. Maybe a pastime. Maybe a godless activity. I don't know. But what needs to be killed? And in the same manner, where do you need to be healed? Where do you need healing? In your life. If there is a time to kill and a time to be healed, what if we paused right here at the end of 2017 and said, there's something that needs to die, but there's also things that need to be healed. I can't look inside your head and your heart and tell you what's going on. I just know this, that there are things in me that need to die and things in me that yet need to be healed. How do we live with that? How do we take time and really ingest what it means to do that? All I can say is this, the challenge is yours to take a moment and reflect on what needs to die. I'm guessing you don't have to dig too far to find it. And maybe for healing, maybe it's some relational things. Maybe it's your walk with the Lord. I don't know. But if there's a time to kill and a time to heal, I think we can take that personally. It goes on to say there's a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. You know, I I think this is important because we're bad emotionally. We're, we've become a little computer-like in our society. And we think our emojis kind of communicate our feelings. And we, we talk through text. And I've found out that I'm a terrible emailer and texter. I come across aggressive and unkind and very blunt. So I'm not allowed to send emails unless they're proofread. And, um, and it's just true. It's terrible. I'm like, I'm just that way. And... Um, and so we can communicate kind of cold-bloodedly. But the reality is we are emotional people. We have deep emotions. We have these things that well up within us. And we mute them and we say, no, no, it's fine. It is fine. I'm not sad. It's okay. Or something really good happens. You're like, yeah, that's good. But, I mean, things will change. And we never engage the two. So here's what I'd like to say. Don't force yourself to laugh if you don't, if you don't have it in you. You don't have to laugh. You don't have to be happy. You can be gracious, but you don't have to walk around with a smile on your face like all's well. Because there is a time to laugh, and there is also a time to weep. So if you need to weep, don't hide that either. Don't hide that. Don't push that away from your life. Allow yourself the opportunity to have the emotions God gave you. Because there is a time to laugh. And there's a lot of joy and good things going on in this room. I met a baby up here that I've known his mother since she was in fourth grade. And she walked up and handed me her baby. I've known this little, this, this girl for, since she was a little girl. And I see her baby. I'm like, oh, and I love babies. And I was like, oh, this is so awesome. This is so good. There's another mom right now in labor having a much worse Sunday than you are. In our church, like, she's in labor. There's good things going. There are those of us who have said goodbye to loved ones this year. And we didn't want to. And it's okay to weep. You don't have to force it. It's okay to be happy. You don't have to force it. There is a time for each. And sometimes they awkwardly overlap. Have you ever been at a family thing after someone's died and you're sitting there and you're crying and someone reminds you of one of the crazy things they used to do and you're like, <laughs> and you start laughing like, oh my gosh. And then you start crying again because you're going to miss that. And you feel like this wild expanse of emotions. That is good. There is a time and a season for such things. It goes on to say there's a time to mourn 
and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Sometimes we need to recognize there's an uh, ending, a necessary ending to certain relationships. And there are times to celebrate what was and move on from certain relationships. It's okay. There is a time to embrace and a time to step back. There's a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away. There's a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. There's a time of love and a time for hate. There's a time for war. There's a time for peace. All this goes to tell us that those things in Genesis where there were seasons and weeks and years that God would mark are important for you and I to understand. We live as people in seasons. There is a time for what you're going through. And my invitation to you is to end this year well and take account with what has been so that you can live fully into what will be. And what will be is his purposes for your life. If we will live in seasons, in the balance that God has ordained, not in the demand that we want. We can't stop winter, but we can live within it. So here's how we'll apply it. We'll ask the question, how do we know or recognize the seasons we're in? How do we know and recognize the seasons we're in? That can be one of the hardest things because for us, naturally, in terms of nature, walk outside and you're like, oh yeah, this is the worst season of all. Unless you like snowmobiling and then I judge you because it's too cold. It's just too cold. But you go out there and you look, you're like, oh, it's winter, right? Nobody walks outside and goes, no, I choose summer. Again, that doesn't make sense. We know what season it is. And we should be able, as Christians, to recognize the seasons of life that we're in. Seasons where maybe God's called us to produce or to be harvested and to give of our life or to maybe rest and be nourished or maybe to grow and to learn. We need to recognize the seasons we're in. Ecclesiastes shows us the many different reactions we have to this life, the times too, the many things we could do. But we also recognize that for us, there comes a point where we have to step back and look at what's going on and at least discern the season and then live according to it. Because I tell you this, if we went out to Ottawa State Beach today and there was a guy putting sunscreen on and laying in the snow, you'd be like, you, sir, have a serious issue. That is ne- this is the wrong season for that behavior, right? Just gleaming white. No, it's good. I just wanted a tan. It's four degrees. What are you doing? It's the wrong season. We should be able to discern seasons in our life. We should be able to look. How do we look then? How do we look? How do we discern the seasons? Well, God gave us the light to govern creation. He's given us his word. And he's given us his spirit. But I just want to pause just a second because we talked about this. Jesus Christ, according to John 1, is the word made flesh. Meaning that Jesus Christ is and reveals himself through the word of God, scripture. The word of God is alive in Jesus Christ. He's the word. He's also the light. He's the light of the world. And God has given us the light to govern our seasons. People go, I don't know what to do. I don't know where I'm at. Maybe it's because you're not living according to the light. According to the seasons Christ has you in. It's not easy. It's often um, a challenge to cal- calm ourselves and choose to live appropriately in season, but we have to. And God has given us the light, Jesus Christ, his word, scripture, which I love how Martin Luther, how Martin said this, scripture is the garments that Christ wears around. Like, just think about that. You want to know what Jesus Christ smells, feels, and walks like? Put on his robe. Walk in his scriptures, spend time there, and allow the Holy Spirit to help us recognize our seasons. You may not know what season of life you're in, but he does. So don't come to me for answers, go to him. Turn to your heavenly father who has given you everything you need to know your season, and he's called you to participate with him in it. For us, when you approach a time of life, or maybe you see changes coming, ask him. Ask him, what should I do? Invite Christ to participate with you in your life. Henry Blackaby says, 
Find where God's at work and join him in it. Get your eyes up and look for what God's doing according to the season of life he has you in. If your season is hard, I think it's important at the end of the year that we just pause and step back and recognize that if you're in a hard season, if things have changed for you this year in ways you never saw and they're not good ways, I think it's important to recognize to turn back to God in that and rely on him. These events are not a shock to him. He will comfort, he will care, and he will be with you in those seasons. The choice we have is in those times of quiet where God puts us into a season of grief. We often rail against him. And what God's trying to do is gather us to him. Remember, Solomon had all the comforts of this life and walked away from God. Sometimes it's in our darker seasons where we recognize how much we need God, how much we want to hold on. God calls us to seasons to live in a specific way and to be a specific thing. We don't always handle seasons in the same way. I think that's important to note. Some people may quiet down when things are hard. Some people may be more verbal when it's hard. You handle it differently, just like we handle winter differently. Some people go snowmobiling and skiing and go for snowshoe walks. (laughs) Some people get a little heavier, sit closer to the fire, and eat chili. (laughs) Right? That's how I handle my season. My season of winter... I would bundle up. I think I'm half badger. Just put me underground and let me be and wake me in April. I'd be great. That's how I would handle winter, right? I kind of snuggle into it. Some people are like, this is a time to live. I'm like, God bless you. God bless you and bring me milk because I'm running low. Like, you know, that's how I feel. We live differently. Maybe we go through seasons of hard differently than our friends, but can we not love them? Can we not discern together how we live this out? If you're in a season of easy, Be thankful. And remember that there is a time to laugh and you can enjoy this, but don't get lost in the temporary things of this life and lose God in the process. If the book of Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes teaches us one thing, it's this. The things of this life are about that long. But eternity continues on forever and we've been called, according to his purposes, to live as though eternity is right in our grasp. Live faithfully in the seasons you're in. I invite you to ask yourself the question, how do I recognize the season? And then remember that the light of God, Jesus Christ, and the word of God, Scripture and the Lord Jesus Christ are here to guide and direct our response to the various seasons we may face from the end of the year to the beginning of another. It is a good time to pause and reflect. I am going to ask you to do me a favor. We are going to close our eyes and just take a moment. And we're going to ask God quietly in our own hearts, because I can't get in your head and tell you what you're thinking, to just tell us where we're at and invite him to maybe show you what season of life he has you living in. God, where are you at work? And how can I join you in it? That's the simple question. God, where are you at work? And how can I join you in it? Would you take a moment of silence and just ask yourself that question? Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for seasons of quiet. Thank you for seasons of noise. Thank you for all the different seasons you put us into. And God, our our request, our humble petition is that you would help us to live fully in every season we're in. Whether it's a season of rest or harvest. Whether it's a season of preparation or lying fallow. God, we don't know always where we're at. But we do want to live in you by the power of your spirit. So come, Lord Jesus, and guide us, your church, as we turn our hearts towards a season in which you seek to walk closely with us and know us even as we come to know you. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to have communion as a congregation. And um, it's a really good time of year. To, to take communion. 
And one of the reasons I, I, I'm thrilled to do this on New Year's Eve is because there's a lot behind us. And if we don't reconcile what's behind us, we'll never live fully into what's ahead of us and the purposes of God. So I want you to pay close attention um, in these next just couple minutes. There's not a lot of words, but these are the words of Jesus Christ when he did for us what we couldn't do. We could not save ourselves. We were lost and mired in sin and death. But by his goodness, by his grace, grace, we have been saved. And we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ Jesus and nothing more. It sounds too simple, but it's not. It's not that simple. It's a life of following Jesus. The gift of salvation is a simple and grand one. And we receive it by faith in Christ. But then we live for it with all that we are. And we know that because Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, sat at a table with his disciples. And it's kind of where the centerpiece of history hinges. Because before this, they'd been eating the Passover meal. The meal where they killed the Passover lamb in the Hebrew family and remembered the exodus out of slavery. That's the meal they were eating. And Jesus Christ, at that meal, picked up the bread and he broke it. And he said to the disciples, this is my body. It's been broken for you. As often as you take and eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And in the same manner also, he took the cup. And after he blessed it, he said to them, This, this is my blood shed for you. This is the New Testament written in my blood. And as often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. What we understand is that Jesus called us to a life of remembering. And it's really important for you and I today to remember that there is much in 2017 that needs to be forgiven under the grace of God. There is much that he has forgiven us for. But there's also much that he's done for us. And so when we come to take a small bite of bread, and dip it into a cup of juice and taste it. We do so remembering that by his wounds we were healed. By his faithful life we've been redeemed. By his life, death, and resurrection, we, the people of God, share an eternal inheritance that doesn't bind us to that past that we have broken so badly, but it calls us into his future, which he has lit with the very Son of God, and given us his word and his spirit to comfort and guide us as we live remembering everything we are is owed to that broken body and that shed blood given so freely for such bad people as us. My friends, our communion table is open at the Foundry Church. What that means is if you have children, they are welcome to come because the Passover meal was a family meal. It was like Thanksgiving. So kids are welcome to come to the table. They may not fully understand what they're doing, but I dare say I don't either. I just know this, that the mystery of communion is that Christ called us to take it and remember him well. So that taken into us is the very reminder of who we are, not in this world, but in Christ Jesus. Would you join me as we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, as we attend to the body and the blood, to remembering that all things indeed are now ready, not by our hand, but by yours. And that by the grace of God, our lives have been redeemed from brokenness and called into life. Lord, may this small piece of bread and this small taste of juice, may it be for us a reminder that our lives are not our own, but we have been bought at a price. And that cost was dear. It was the very son of God. But now we are called to live in his resurrected power. May we, your church, faithfully live into this identity as sons and daughters of Almighty God through the redemption blood of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. It's been a good year in a lot of ways. It's been a rough year in a lot of lives. But we know this. It's all held in the gracious hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. So whether we live or we die, we do it to the glory of him who died on our behalf. Today we're going to do what we did last week, just a different song. We're going to sing our benediction.
we're going to leave by a song. It's uh, to the tune of Old Dang Syne, um, and Ren Collective respun it in a different way as a song of gratitude for all that God has done for us. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do. I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand up, if you would, and we are going to sing this song. At the end of the song, our hope and our prayer for you is that you go and you end this year well, and you begin this next new year in the power and strength of him who conquered death and hell, that your life would not be your own but be his lived through you.